This is your reminder that the BBC has yet to address the consistent transphobic leanings in its news coverage. And while the team behind Doctor Who is not connected to this in any way, since this is a BBC-owned property, I'm going to keep pointing it out until the problem gets resolved. Links in a pinned comment below if you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll stop saying it when it stops being a problem. Um, it, <sighs> well, that was new. The Giggle final special of David Tennant's limited run as the 14th Doctor. And I know, I know the thing that has sucked all the oxygen out of the room for every discussion of this episode. I know what it is. I've already had people poking me going, hey, what do you think about this? I will get to it. Let me, however, talk about the rest of the episode up to that thing which this will also be your spoiler warning. While I am not mentioning what the thing is, and I will get to it a little bit later, I'm just going to be talking about this thing as I go and doing my normal thing of not necessarily going in chronological order all the way through. I am saving one specific thing to address on the back half, but I want to talk about the rest of it first, because even separate from that one thing, I think there's plenty to talk about here, and I'm going to do that. So we open with our introduction or reintroduction if you're a massive Classic Who uh, fan. And I say massive because the Celestial Toymaker, where the character that Neil Patrick Harris is playing, originates from is a lost episode. I believe they're now working on an animated uh, recreation of it. But this is not an episode a lot of people are familiar with outside of maybe reading a wiki about. It's one of those things that's a bit harder to find, even if you like classic Doctor Who. Well, I say harder to find. The actual episodes you can't find at all until we have the animated recreation. But, you know, there were things that you could look up. There were some still images. There was audio. There were things like that. But it's not a lot to go on, and not everybody is up for just that kind of stuff without the full context of the thing. So he's an interesting pull already. And the other thing that the episode addresses pretty head-on as it goes along is that he also dates back to a time in Doctor Who where how grounded Doctor Who as a show was meant to be in reality, for a better, for lack of a better way to put it, wasn't as solid yet. Even early on, the show mostly leaned on science and not a ton on outright fantasy, but there were episodes like this, uh, the second Doctor story, The Mind Robber, where the Doctor and his companions are literally trapped in the land of fiction, that kind of gets a sci-fi-ish explanation later, but it's also the kind of concept that, like, modern Doctor Who wouldn't touch this. It's too, it's too fairy tale. It's, it's too, this doesn't work with the level of ground that we've gone for. Like, Doctor Who has never been scientifically sound at any point, but it has had an internal logic that's been relatively consistent, especially since the reboot in 2005. And a character like Toymaker breaks it by his nature and how he operates and the fact that there isn't really a valid scientific explanation for what he can do. And they roll with that. I like that a lot. But I started talking about Neil Patrick Harris. He is clearly having so much fun with this part. And I normally say that as a praise in general. I think it's a good thing. Uh, you know, barring a piece meant to be super serious and dour. But, like, if something's meant to have a sense of fun to it, it always feels nice when the actors feel like they are having fun as well. I consider that a positive, kind of almost objectively, at least to my taste, which means it's not really objective, but you get what I mean. That's something that I think is a good thing under most circumstances. But it's especially important here because kind of the point of the toy maker is he does this for fun. He's not trying to take over the universe or wipe people out. He has no machinations. There's no 
philosophy behind this. This isn't Davros, you know, who wants to feel the power within his hand to destroy everything just to know that he could. This isn't the Daleks who are fundamentally against everything that is not them. This isn't the Cybermen who have this undercurrent philosophy of everything that can be made into a should be, we are superior. There's none of that. He's just doing it because it's fun. So it is vital that it come across that this character is having a blast. Because if he's not, why do it? And the thing is, I could see a version of this character who's much more dour and like make, make him into more of an obsessive about games, where it's less about fun and it's more of a compulsion. You could do that. I like this better, though. I like just leaning into the idea of he does this for fun. Let him have fun. Right down to lip syncing to freaking Spice Girls and dancing all over unit. And I love, I love the little moment from the doctor that kind of addresses head on the fact that you can't explain him by normal rules because he has this quick exchange with Shirley. If I told you he manipulates atoms with the power of thought, would you believe it? Is that what he does? If you want to think that so we can move forward, sure. Go with that, but no, he doesn't obey the same rules, which I just like. I understand why this kind of loosey-goosey nature is not standard in Doctor Who anymore, and I'm not saying it should become standard, but I like that they do just enough of a justification for why this is the case here. I think Neil Patrick Harris has a lot of fun with it. Uh, the shifting accents I found kind of interesting. Your accent seems to have slipped. I hope the kid doesn't enjoy him. Um, I'm not, I don't know if there's meant to be a reason why the German is the one he goes to most frequently, but like he drops it for British a few times. He goes American at some point, like especially when he's chastising the doctor about the companions he's lost. And the doctor, you know, has the little asterisks that most of these companions have had. So they haven't been totally tragic, you know, that Clara still lives in the last second of her life, that Bill's consciousness lives on. And the toy maker just goes, oh, well, that's all right then. Very American. So my read on the different accents is it's just part of the game. It's just him. Can, it's part of his having fun. I'll talk this way because this is fun to me right now. And maybe I'll switch to this accent because I'll feel like that's fun. He can be fickle. He's bound by the rules of whatever game he's playing. But things like how he talks. Those aren't bound to rules of games, so he can just be as fickle as he wants. What feels like fun? German right now. German feels like fun. So that's my read on it, at least. And that's a phrase you're going to hear a couple times as I talk about this episode. My read and my interpretation on a few things, because, again, some things, especially when we get to the thing that I'm holding off on, uh, we will get to it. But, you know, there's a fair number of things that, sat right with me, but also because I have a certain amount of interpretation that I bring to it that is a little bit extra textual, meaning it is not 100% explicit within the body of the episode. Oh, and before we get any farther, I should note this. At time of recording, I know there is available a behind the scenes segment. It's about 15 minutes on the Doctor Who channel. Um, and I've also heard that like there's some other stuff out there that has Russell T. Davis talking about some of the thought process and talking about how some things like would work. I have not seen any of that and that's on purpose because I want what views I give you here to be based only on the text of the episode itself. I will check those things out later and if after I've seen them, I feel that they are worth delving into more, maybe I'll do another video or if it's something I can throw together quickly, maybe I'll do it as a short. No promises, but understand that whatever opinion you hear from me is based strictly off my viewing of this. And more to the point, if you put down in the comments, well, what you said in your read on this is wrong because RTD said this. I'm not trying to be rude about this, but I don't care. Uh, I brought this up when I talked about the Davros thing with Children in Need. Interviews are not canon. And while in that one, I did still talk about it a little bit because it is possible that interviews and what is said in interviews could be an indication of what may be canon later and what might be intended. But in and of themselves, they're not canon. Because if you are going to counter 
anything that I have about my interpretation or my beliefs or my hopes with what RTD said that is not within canon, I am not really going to address it because just because he said it, again, that just indicates his intention. That doesn't mean that he's actually going to force it to be canon later either. He might, he might not. Again, interviews are not canon. All right, so the toy maker. I like the interactions and the energy that he brings, particularly when interacting directly with Tennant. I think he brings, I, I actually kind of like Neil Patrick Harris when he does kind of menacing characters. He was quite good in The Matrix Resurrection, which just as a reminder, was a way better movie than most of you acted like it was. But I like when he brings the sense of menace, but also that sense of fun, which he does really well and counteracted by the doctor who's taking this all very seriously. Go back to the TARDIS. You never tell me to do that. And I love the doctor initially trying to take him on just with the cutting of the deck because he has the ace up his sleeve of best two out of three, which was very clever. But what I like about that is he's rolling the dice. There is even odds that he will win right now and this whole thing will be over. It isn't, and we move on to his safety net that he already figured out, best two out of three, but I just like that he was willing to roll those dice. I like that, that was good. Uh, the puppet imagery was, was decently creepy. I'd say, like, here's the thing, I've said before that I don't find old, old style puppets or dolls particularly creepy in and of themselves. It's Part of why some of the inherent creepiness that really got people about night terrors didn't really work on me because I just don't find those dolls that creepy. I will say that with the puppets, they leaned into the creepy nature by the way they acted. Not just the fact like, oh, marionette, a little bit of a little bit of a ventriloquist dummy thing going. No, like the way that they behaved and the thing that it said, like especially the uh, the widow. <laughs> Puppet, I guess. I'm poor wee sticky Sue. I don't know what to do. It made it a bit more creepy. Not in a way that actually actively creeped me out, but I'm like, see, this is more effective than just showing me a creepy doll and be like, doesn't this creep you out? I'm like, no. You have to actually do something creepy with it, which this does. So I did like that. And the uh, the human-sized mannequin, especially when it was briefly the doctor. I thought I was <laughs> Good imagery. Solid. I like it. And I... I loves me a, a non-Euclidean maze. You go through a door, it doesn't go where it should, and you try to go back through it, it doesn't take you to where you were before. They become a mild cliche, thanks to a lot of video games, like um, Layers of Fear or even PT, uh, going back to that. But it's still effective if you can do it well. And this does it well and doesn't lean on it too hard where it gets old. It does it for just long enough that it's effective. And also... Despite some people telling me in the comments of the previous one that, you know what, Donna said she didn't remember all the doctor's history and that it must have just been in the not things brain and she can't hold it. A uh, fair number of people said, you know what, I think she actually does remember is just being nice to him. That didn't sit right with me. I didn't reply to those comments. That didn't sit right with me because I'm like, I don't think they're at a point where she's going to lie to him to spare his feelings. Like, I understand she'd be gentle, but I don't think she'd lie to him. And I got a nice confirmation on that because it has to be reiterated to her through, you know, the little marionette show talking about Amy, Clara, Bill, the Flux. She doesn't remember. She actually asked the question. Is all of this true? And again, bringing up the Flux again and giving more weight to the consequences of the thing that Chibnall did that he just ignored the consequences on. So again, I like that being reiterated. I'm not entirely positive that the having the salt superstition at the edge of the universe was a necessary move for bringing in the toy maker. I mean, it works well enough. I cast that salt at the edge of the universe. I played a game and let him in. I think it would have personally, at least, worked a little better for me if it wasn't the episode immediately following, if like there had been some time between. I know in this case, that wasn't gonna happen. David Tennant was only doing the three specials. So like, that was never gonna be the case. But I don't know, I feel like that plant and payoff would have landed a little bit better for me and felt a little bit more clever if I'd had the time to forget that that happened and then bringing it back later, bringing it back immediately after, like, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Sure, that works. Why not?
So since I'm already talking about the toy maker, let's talk about the giggle and how it operates. Because the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. Now, this is also where we're going to get a little bit into my interpretations of how all this works, not necessarily the intended canon of how it works. Because I'm going to zero in on Kate Lethbridge Stewart to explain what I mean by this. I really like the way that the toy maker explains it. Why does everyone think they're right? So that they win. I make every opinion supreme. Everybody just thinks that they're right on their first impulses because that way they'll always try to win. That framing, giving humanity that perspective of you're either winning or you're losing. See, normally, Dropping a line about, like, cancel culture, which is dropped in there a little bit. That's the game of the 21st century. They shout, and they type, and they cancel. That would normally annoy me. This is actually a time where, like, it's not making a huge thing out of it, but dropping that, if this is the point you're making, that humans, when they are forced into a mindset of, you are right, and you have to go out and prove it and you have to win on the fact that you're right, otherwise you lose. Forcing that to be the lens through which we view the world, yeah, that does feed into a lot of the most toxic behavior, particularly online behavior. And tying that through a single line to cancel culture without turning it into a whole and cancel culture is terrible and here's all these examples of it, because that's often where things get really dicey, but just acknowledging it is like, yeah, it's, it can very easily, is not necessarily always in my view, but can very easily become part of a, we have to win um, and the other side has to lose and we're drawing battle lines and we're making this uh, zero sum game of win or lose. Yeah, it, it feeds into the toxic side of human nature. So I said I was going to zero in on Kate. So here's what I really like about what they used to illustrate with her. These things that she says, that, that she is distrusting of the doctor because he's an alien. We've been infiltrated by aliens, by a man with two hearts, a man who changes his face and cannot be trusted. And also the stuff that she says towards Shirley. I'll focus on that a little more specifically in a minute. But what I like about that is that my read on this is that it is basically locking people in to dying on the hill of their gut instinct and their base level responses. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that. For Kate, it makes total sense, regardless of how much time she spent with the doctor, working with the doctor, given that she is the daughter of the brigadier, that she herself has been fighting aliens for most of her life, her natural gut instinct is going to be distrust. Now, normally when working with the doctor, she overcomes that initial distrust with the, you know, reminding yourself, okay, but he's on our side, he helps us, he's that thing. But at the core, underneath that, is still that seed of xenophobia, that fear of the other, that distrust of the other. And what the giggle appears to have done is remove the higher layer of brain functions that look at the gut reaction she has and go, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't apply here, or that's not helpful. So here's what I've said elsewhere that I'm gonna reiterate here. And I've said this oftentimes talking with people who are working on getting better about certain aspects of how they view the world and treat other people. And oftentimes they will have a lot of concerns because they'll still have that seed, they'll still have that initial thought in their head that is racist, sexist, homophobic, et cetera. And when I say people, I'm not strictly saying people who aren't me. No, 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 I've had to deal with this too. What I've said in those cases is you are not fully responsible for your gut instinct or your first emotional reaction to something. Because of what you have been through in your life and the society that you have been raised in and the environment around you, your initial gut reaction is something that you will have very little control over. And you are not fully responsible for having an initial gut in your head reaction that is 
racist, sexist, homophobic, etc. And like, I say for the most part, like if you haven't been trying to work on that and you're just letting it happen, that's a problem. But that kind of gets the second part of what I tend to p- tell people. You are not fully, solely responsible for that initial thought that is carrying that seed of something that you know is wrong. You're not fully responsible for that because it is a gut instinct that's going to take a very long time to get rid of if it's even possible to do it all. But what you absolutely are responsible for is what you do as a result of that gut reaction. Because one of the least helpful things that can happen is somebody encounters something or sees something and has a bigoted thought in their head about it and then goes, oh gosh, I'm such a terrible person. I still think that, oh, what's wrong with me? Like, you're not helping anybody doing that. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping anybody else and you're not getting better. What you can do is go, okay, would have been nice if I hadn't had that thought, but here's why I know it's wrong. Your higher brain functions go, okay, yeah, that was a thought I'm not proud of, but I don't have to act on it. Here's why it's wrong. Here's why I'm not gonna say that. Here's what I know that overrides, improves that gut instinct that I can't fully control wrong. You're not responsible for your first gut reaction, but you are responsible for whether or not you act on it or tamp it down. And I don't mean like in a repression way, I mean take into account what it is you're doing and not just take your first impulse and go, this is the hill I will die on. And that is my read on what the giggle is. It removes that that higher level, that sort of, checks and balance so that whatever your initial gut response is, you just do that so hard. So for Kate with the doctor, he's an alien and aliens are harmful to us, doesn't get tampered by what would be her normal brain function, which is, but I know the doctor, but he's helped us, but, but the, there isn't time for that. Those aren't allowed to come in. And we see that also with her interactions with Shirley, accusing Shirley of not actually being disabled. And as for her in that chair, I've seen you walk, I've seen you walking, don't deny it. And that was really well done. And I I had already loved before that, that they showed her get up out of the chair and stand at a console. Because given the depictions we are normally shown, of disabled people, such as wheelchair users, is that they are always in this. This is the only way they get around. When the reality is, there are many people who make use of mobility aids, be they they wheelchairs or anything else, where they are not 100% all the time restricted to this. Some of them can stand up. Some of them can even walk to some degree, but what they can't do is engage with the degree of walking that society is built around assuming that they can do. That's what they can't do. They may not have the stamina in their legs. They may not have the coordination, whatever it might be that is limiting them. That doesn't mean they can't stand. That doesn't mean they can't take some steps. And if they can stand and can take some steps, that does not mean they're faking it. But because our media depictions generally rolls with the idea of, well, you're in a wheelchair, that's it. That's all you're ever gonna be. It makes people react the way that Kate reacts when she's not having those higher functions calming her down, which is, I've seen you get up, so you're faking it. And to be clear, this doesn't just impact people who use mobility aids. This is an issue for people who are deaf, for people who are blind. You can be designated legally deaf or legally blind without being totally deaf or totally blind. And because maybe you are legally blind in the sense that, okay, we know you should not be allowed to operate a a car or you you need these assistances in order to get through life for both your safety and the safety of others, but they'll notice that someone's waving at them and then some jackass will go, ah, you're not blind. Like, no, they could see the shape. They responded to a shape, but not well enough that they could function the way someone who doesn't have any issues with their sight or can have their sight more or less fully corrected by lenses. They can't do what those people will do. And society's built on the assumption that your sight is at a certain base level. And if theirs is so far below that, then that does not mean they see literally nothing, but it means they can't see well enough 
to function the way the rest of us function. And similarly with hard of hearing, it doesn't mean you can't hear literally anything. It just means you can't do it well enough for whatever reason without assistance or possibly not at all to be able to function in the way the society is constructed on the assumption you can do those things. So I already loved the fact that Shirley stood up and just very subtly, initially, addressed that core fact of people with disability. But then to see Kate, who knows her and appears to respect her and is horrified once she gets her senses back at what she has done. Shirley, I'm so sorry. I think that was a good organic way to draw attention to this entire issue with a character that I was already enjoying from her first appearance in Starbeast. And I like that it feeds into demonstrating how the giggle works. So it's not superfluous. It's giving us two examples so we know it's not unique to the doctor. She has a xenophobic reaction to the doctor and an ableist reaction towards Shirley. So we get multiple examples to get an idea of how this thing freaking works. And I think it is well done and well integrated into the story. And anyone who says it's just there for pandering, obviously does not understand how you weave these things into a story. Like, look, things can be done incredibly clunkily and feel forced and be like, why was that even there? I know why this is here. It is demonstrating in two ways, because I think it is important to do it in more than just one, just to really make the point of how this works. It's demonstrating in two ways what the giggle does to people, and it is using the open opportunity of that to demonstrate a problem that exists in society. That, to me is well-integrated writing. That is very soundly integrating a societal point into a story that benefits from you making that point. I think this is all really well done. Since we're on the topic of Shirley, the ramp at the end showing the TARDIS's wheelchair accessible, that is really nice because I didn't clock this at first when we first saw the new TARDIS in Starbeast, other people point out in my comments, it's all ramps, which means someone who makes use of a wheelchair can move around in there. I didn't clock that initially. I was like, oh, cool. But funnily enough, again, because I'm not disabled and I have blind spots around this, my mobility does not require assistance. So it didn't occur to me that even though the interior was navigable by use of a wheelchair, that there was still that bump, there's still that step up. And now there's a little ramp to flip out it wouldn't have occurred to me that the TARDIS needed that as well. But of course it wouldn't have occurred to me. I don't need a mobility aid, so I have blind spots. This was a little bit that I did catch some, a little tiny bit of behind the scenes because evidently some things noted by fans of the show who are wheelchair users, that found its way to RTD. He actually told me about a fan who'd contacted him, who was a wheelchair user, and said how much he admired Russell's work. He said, even though I can't get in the TARDIS because it's not wheelchair accessible. And he didn't want them to feel excluded, like they couldn't also travel in the TARDIS. This is a tiny thing that just means the show is opening up and embracing and allowing a portion of the audience that previously had a certain barrier to the idea that they could be the companion or they could be the doctor as themselves that barrier is now gone. I see that only as a positive thing. You finally got over the 21st century. So the other thing I want to talk about the giggle is that it also gets us some interesting moments with this doctor, with the 14th doctor, because he does something that I like seeing when it's done well. And like, this can go either way for me. So he notes that, you know, human beings for all your brilliance, You've got a lot of problems under the surface. You've got a lot of base instincts that are there that sometimes you don't overcome. And all those are running rampant. All the anger out there on the street, the lies, the righteousness, that's human, that's you. That's who you are, using your intelligence to be stupid. This is nice for me to see, particularly coming from a doctor with David Tennant's face. So, it can go to either extreme for me um, and not work for me in both cases, although not to the same degree. I'll get to that in a second. The idea of the doctor blanketly condemning humans or blanketly praising humans. In terms of blanketly condemning, that 
tends to bother me a little bit less because usually when that happens, like say when the Ninth Doctor made a general complaint about, you know, stupid apes. I did it again. I picked another stupid ape. That came at a moment where he was just emotionally frustrated. And I understood why he said that and it didn't necessarily feel core to how he viewed people. And the Ninth Doctor was in a dour place anyways. But then there's the other extreme, which we saw from characters like the Tenth Doctor relatively frequently, not exclusively the Tenth Doctor, but we did see it a fair bit with the Tenth Doctor, this whole thing. Oh, humans. Oh, you're so brilliant and you're so wonderful. I love this and this and this and this about you. Human beings, you are amazing. That used to really bug me. I mean, I say used to, it didn't stop bugging me, but it, it happens less often, or at least I notice it less often as time has gone on. But that really did annoy me because Look, I don't think there's a problem with the Doctor, again, especially Tennant's Doctor, um, who didn't think he had a home in Gallifrey anymore at the time, uh, to have a very strong affinity for humanity. I think there's nothing wrong with him having a soft spot and enjoying humans. I do kind of have a problem with him aggrandizing them and talking about them like there's somehow the most special thing ever. Sometimes it can work, like in The End of Time Part 2. We must look like insects to you. <laughs> I think you look like giants. That does work because of the specific framing and, and him talking to that character in particular. That works. Side note real quick, Wilf, I know we couldn't get Bernard Cribbins back for this. We were stuck with a body double in the opening scene, but I also really like that they have the dialogue that he's in the he's in the garden shooting at moles. But here we are. Brother, no. I like the acknowledgement that he's still there, that he's not gone. And that was kind of all they could do, and I'm glad that they did it. So it still felt like there was a presence there, even though the actor sadly passed away and could not appear. So anyway, coming back. So like that conversation he has with Wilf and that felt less overall aggrandizing because it feeds into the fact that in a little bit, that doctor, the 10th doctor was gonna sacrifice himself to save Wilf. So it was kind of important in that story to reiterate the idea that he doesn't think he's above humanity and he sees a lot of beauty in them. But there are other times where he'll just go off on like, oh, humans, look at you out there doing all this. And it, it just bugs me. Like, for all the things you've seen, all the species, planets, all over space and time, if you are implying that we are as good as it gets, that's real depressing. Like, you can have a soft spot for something and also not think it's the best thing ever. I am more okay with the idea that humanity is the doctor's guilty pleasure than, like, something that he thinks is wonderful and amazing, which is how he has frequently acted at various points in the past. And again, not exclusively the Tenant Doctor, but it happened a fair bit under him. But to have him in particular acknowledge this other side of humanity. The human race might be clever and bright and brilliant. It's also savage and venal and relentless. And especially because it doesn't feel like he's saying it in a way that negates any of the praise he's given, but it's his acknowledgement here that, yeah, you guys can be amazing, but boy, boy, you've got some issues. Because, yeah. Yeah, individually and collectively. Yeah, we do. Good. Good. The blind praising of human beings by, oh, not just the doctor, by aliens in general. It's a little bit of a sci-fi trope. It comes up every now and then where, you, like, you'll just get non-human species being like, oh yes, I truly admire humans. They have this that no other species have. And I'm like, BS, nonsense. I don't buy that for a second. You're just finding an excuse to make humans look like the best thing. And please tell me we're not. So that was a moment that I just liked. That, that felt like it was there for me almost. And actually, since we've kind of touched on it now, I want to address the idea of how this doctor is admittedly, in some ways, different from the 10th. I had kind of mentioned previously, I think in both episodes, that I didn't see a huge difference between this Doctor and the 10th Doctor. And I've gotten pushback on that in both of my previous two reviews. And I want to clarify exactly where my headspace was at. Because I think, to a certain degree, people were like looking at this Doctor and thinking of, I don't know, Series 2, Series 3, heck, even Series 4 Doctor, and going, well, no, this one's quite a bit different. He's gentler, he's softer, he's Easy, he opens up easier. He's 
I'm more inclined to say that he loves someone. Like, okay, yes, that's all true, but what I meant more was not that he's behaving exactly like 10, but what he is doing is behaving as I would expect 10 to have developed if he hadn't regenerated when he did. Taking the experiences from the end of time, parts one and two, and continuing on, regardless of whether he had the exact same experiences as the other incarnations, but moving forward from that, if David Tennant just stayed in the part this whole time, this is kind of how I would have expected him to end up as eventually. So that's a little bit more what I meant, and less that it feels exactly like 10, but more like, yeah, this feels like if 10 had stuck around. But I think that I see the value in doing that in this episode pretty well. I saw some value in it in the previous episode in Wild Blue Yonder because you really needed that established dynamic between the Doctor and Donna for so much of that episode to work at all and having the Doctor be more distinctly different, which was my gut instinct for what I wanted. Um, that dynamic wouldn't have worked at all if he was completely different in his behavior. Um, in general, like, I still like the idea of a doctor with a pre-existing face, but a different personality. I still kind of like that as a notion, but that's not what they did. And what they've done does play much better if he feels very connected to the 10th doctor, which especially stuff that goes on towards the tail end. And yes, I promise we will get there. That feels like this is doing stories that benefit from him feeling fundamentally, in my opinion, like the 10th Doctor, or at least like an evolution of the 10th Doctor, these stories benefit from that, which is good. Because if you're going to take an idea that I am resistant to, the very least you could do is use that idea to tell stories that you couldn't tell if you didn't use that idea. Hold on to that notion. We will be coming back to it. But the last thing that I think I will say before we get um, to the big spoiler stuff and the thing I know you've all been waiting to hear my opinion on, tying into the fact that this Doctor feels quite a bit like the 10th, but also a bit different. He has his confrontation with the toy maker, and he doesn't do what 10 usually did, which is to issue a warning, which is to say, you need to stop or I will take you apart. Why would I leave this place? Because if you don't, I'll have to stop you. Instead, he offers a hand in friendship. We can take your games back to the stars. We can play across the cosmos. He offers to travel with the toy maker with no threat. No, if you don't, I will do X. Just come with me and we'll, we'll play. The games will be across the stars. Now, this is not the first time he's done that. He did that with the master. We could travel the stars. It would be my honor. Because you don't need to own the universe, just see it. That was a character that he had a very specific and at one point previously friendly history. He's now extending that level of empathy and offer to just, we don't have to fight. And not again, not in a threat way, not in a, I know what I'll have to do if you turn me down way, just as a way to try and bring an end to this. He's offering that to someone who has only ever been his enemy. I like that as an evolution for him. There was one other thing to touch on quickly. Mel showing up um, is fine. I don't feel like there is as much dug into with her as they did with, say, Ace or Tegan in Power of the Doctor. But then again, Mel's on-screen appearances, there isn't as much to deal with. Um, there were little acknowledgments of her past. I like the mention of Sabalong Glitz, and it was decently done. She doesn't add a ton by her presence, but she also doesn't detract. And if you're someone who... In, is increasingly enjoying Classic Who, then yeah, she's a fun addition, but she doesn't need to be there, but she's not a focus either. So she's a unnecessary but fun addition. But okay, let's talk about the thing. The bi generation. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a whole thing. And it took me a little while to figure out my thoughts on this. And I also did something that I normally don't do. Something that I very deliberately do not do when I do these, well, honestly, reviews on most things, unless I'm getting to something very late and I had no way of, of avoiding what the general opinion of it is, that happened with, say, Barbie. Um, unless that happens, especially with something that I'm planning to see right off, I do not see other people's reviews 
before I sit down to shoot my own. And I held true to that, but I bent it a teeny bit. I did, after seeing it, bum around Twitter a little bit to kind of gauge general reaction to this. Now, I was very careful to spend very little time on this. I didn't dive down a rabbit hole because I didn't want to get the full brunt of the discourse. So what I found, and this was very handy, was Crispy Pro, who is another Doctor Who-focused YouTuber, who's very good, by the way, and who um, I enjoy his work. And I feel like he and I are often on the same page, not necessarily in terms of our preferences or what we like or don't like, but the fact that I think we both largely approach the show as something that we always want to like, whether or not we do. So knowing that, knowing him, and knowing that's the kind of uh, viewer he cultivates, checking when he put out a tweet asking what do people think of this, and just browsing through the replies on that, and doing it relatively early before it had the possibility to, you know, turn into just toxicity, which it's Twitter. That can happen regardless of what the fandom is or what anybody says. But what I saw there was a fair number of people basically amounting to, I liked it up until the bi generation, or people going like, I don't know what I feel about the bi generation. So this, at least from my quick glance, which was all I was willing to do before sitting down to shoot this, people seem a little bit divided on this. And I do get why. If you are very much into the logistics, the mechanics, and the continuity and preserving canon, then yeah, this is gonna bug you. You know, there would have been a time not too long ago where I might have made a joke like, if continuity and being consistent matters that much to you, why are you even watching Doctor Who? Because this show's never been good about that. And that is true, but I'm not doing anybody ever any favors by pretending that an audience who cares about this doesn't exist. I know them. I've met them in my comments and at conventions. I know that there is a fandom that, as inconsistent as the show has been, that the way that they approach this and possibly other media as well, they still want a certain amount of consistency. They want things to behave by the rules that as they understand them. And I'm not immune to that myself. My own general thing is I don't need things to match reality, but I would like it if you would adhere to the rules you have established. And if you're gonna break them, please tell me why. That is my general base level. And for me and for my looking at and interpreting this, I do feel that there is something that, at least for me, works, which is, yes, the um, toy maker can do all these things that break all the rules, all the laws of physics, the laws of reality as we know them. And in my mind, by his presence, the rules are a little in flux, kind of for everything. What if the toy maker's domain is still lingering? Just for a few seconds while we're in a state of play. Not fully, not like anything could happen, but like something that otherwise, as the 15th Doctor, Shudigatwa's Doctor says, shouldn't be possible and is only a myth. I have bi-generated. <laughs> There's no such thing. By generation is supposed to be a myth. It could happen now. Now, is it a little bit of a cop out to be like, well, this is a mythological thing. It's never happened before, like since when? That is a little bit of, you know, pulling it out of your rear end. But I think just having the toy maker present and the nature of what he is and how he operates, to me, just having him there makes the rules flexible enough that I'm okay with this happening this time in terms of, like, regeneration has never worked like this before. Now, normally that would bother me, but in this case, I feel like that explanation, at least for me in my head, works. That having been said, on paper, I really would have said this is a bad idea. Because, first of all, the general idea of having two doctors interacting with each other in a way that isn't acknowledged as breaking the rules of time and space. And it isn't a case of like Tennant's doctor is lingering, but he's only gonna last a short amount of time or it's not happening at the edge, which was introduced in the power of doctor and is a cool idea. And you know, we're not doing any of that. They're just both existing. No, don't do that. That's a really bad idea. That is just begging for people to continually demand the return of Tennant's doctor and to 
just say forever, boy, the show would have been so great if he just stayed on. They they kept that doctor around. Why didn't they? And like fans may or may not still do that. But like, if you were just to tell me the idea, I would look at it and go, I don't see what we gain. And it's just going to cause so many headaches and so many arguments. Can this possibly be worth it? And here's the funny thing. I think it is. Because kind of like what I said before, you can do something that I think is a bad idea, but if you do something with it that you couldn't have done otherwise, and that thing is worth doing, brings me joy. If I see this thing, I go, okay, I enjoy that. And you couldn't have done it if you hadn't done this thing that I thought was a bad idea. That can work. And it does here in a number of ways. There's, there is a little bit of kind of the campy goofiness of the visual of them being pulled apart and then they're each in half of the outfit, which took me a second to realize that that is what had happened. Ah, dang it. I had meant to, I meant to let my hair down for this half. Hmm. I suppose the, uh, the question people are really wondering is, uh, am, am I not wearing proper trousers? I don't know. What did that sound like? <laughs> we do authenticity around here. Anyways. Yeah, the visual is a little bit on the silly side. It's RTD doing Doctor Who. You kind of have to deal with a certain amount of that. Um, and it's made it's been made clear over the course of these three specials that, yes, he's not going to abandon some of his goofier, campier instincts in regards to the show. But when I say that this does something that could not have happened if not for the choice to do the by generation, here is what I mean. This becomes a vehicle to do something that the show could never do unless the show was ending, and I mean permanently. It gives a doctor a happy ending. I've never been so happy in my life. That can't happen. Because any other time to have a doctor and have them settle and be happy and just live and not feel the need to gallivant about and run away from their own baggage, that would mean the show's over because the doctor's no longer going about having adventures all the dang time. So what's the show at that point? The show has to be over. That has to be how you end the entire thing. And honestly, I've said in the past, my uh, notion for the perfect way to end the show, if anybody ever did decide to end it permanently, would be to have the doctor, whatever incarnation is around at that point, to go and see Susan, his granddaughter, who when he left her, when the first doctor left her, said, One day, I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. And I would say, going with her and settling in and saying, I'm done traveling, I'm home, would be the way to end the whole show. And this basically does that with the equivalent of the 10th Doctor. Again, I, I know he is, the 14th is a little bit different behaviorally, but having him settle with Donna feels emotionally to me the same vein as having the first or any incarnation of the Doctor go back to Susan. And you can't do that without ending the show or undoing it. One of two things would have to happen if they attempted to do this in any other way. Either the show would have to end, and inevitably, because we live in a time when franchises are not allowed to die, somebody would bring it back, either by injecting all this interstitial stuff and like, oh, well, here was a regeneration you didn't know about happened in between, and then it's effectively like the show hasn't ended, or by just undoing the happy ending and sending the doctor off again. And then it's like, what was the point? But he can have it. He can have the happy ending, the family. He still has his TARDIS, but because there's another doctor who is clearly demonstrably super eager to go out and have adventures and go out and save the universe, this one doesn't have to. The things that would drive him to always keep going and never slow down don't have to apply to him anymore. He doesn't have to worry what about all the planets in danger? The, what if the universe is in jeopardy? The doctor is going to take care of that. And even what gets addressed in this episode, this idea of I have to keep running because if I slow down, 
all the sadness hits. What am I? What am I now? This doctor is not self-reflecting because he won't stop moving. He's not even really pausing to have a proper conversation with Donnie. He's just moving as fast as he can because slowing down might mean, at least for this incarnation, not necessarily every incarnation, but in this incarnation, slowing down might mean realizing how unhappy he is doing what he's doing and realizing he'd like to stop. But also giving him a TARDIS so that, yeah, he can take Rose to a jaunt to Mars. He can do a quick thing here or there. He took me to New York last week. Yeah. The Gilded Age, it was amazing. Well, Where the TARDIS becomes like a camper van. It's something you, you load the family into and have a little holiday, but you don't live in it. You don't have to constantly be traveling. It's there for when you need it, but you can relax. You can just have a home. There has never been the opportunity to tell that story on this show, and I don't know of any way you could have done it without doing something like this. And I'm sure some will argue with me, well, what about the Metacrisis Doctor? That version of the 10th Doctor got to have Rose and was given, in theory, the ability to create his own TARDIS and is moving all about that universe. Isn't that kind of a happy ending? For that version of the Doctor that we never saw again, sure it is, but there was still the tinge of sadness on it because the one we followed back to our universe still had to deal with the weight and the loss. What this whole thing allows us to do is have a regeneration without the tragedy. Because no matter how excited you are for any new Doctor, be it Shudi Gatwa or anybody else, and I will talk a little bit about his performance in particular, again, let me get through stuff. This is a long one if you hadn't guessed already. What is really nice about this is no matter how excited you are about a doctor, normally there's that sense of loss, but this other one's gone. We get just once to have a regeneration without the sadness. And I think there was a time 15 years ago or so where I would have said like, but the sadness is powerful. Don't do it without sadness. And I'm not saying I want this to become the template. I'm not saying I ever want this to happen ever again. But just once. Funny thing is I fought the most battles for all those years. And now I know I fought this. To let it be the happiest version of regeneration it can be. Where Donna and her family aren't left mourning a version of the doctor that died, where we don't have to see him gone, where the audience doesn't have to mourn, and also just get to enjoy the excitement of a new doctor. That's magical. And this is what I mean, this is, this is the perfect version of having your cake and eating it too, because we're getting the excitement of the new doctor and we're getting this happy ending but as I said, normally the only way to get an ending like this would be to end the show. But we get it here and the show doesn't have to end. More adventures. And I'm sure some people are going to go, well, yeah, but you know they're going to bring him back because he's still hanging around. Here's the thing I'm not so sure about that because I assumed that about the Metacrisis Doctor. I had assumed for so long, oh, they created this other version of the Doctor just so they can bring David Tennant back at a later point. But then eventually when they did bring David, David Tennant back, they didn't do it with the Metacrisis Doctor. I normally would make that same kind of assumption. Like, oh, well, they're just gonna, they're just gonna have him come back at a later time and you know they're gonna like, I don't know. I don't know. Because I assumed that before and I was wrong. I assumed that with this writer and I was wrong. And if somebody can prove me wrong on something that I was dead certain about that was very much in the same vein, I'm not taking it as a given that we're going to see this doctor again. I am going to hope that this, he just gets to have his happy ending. I, I know there will be some people who say, well, he should come back the same way there are some people who are like, Marvel should bring back Tony Stark and, and Steve Rogers. No, they shouldn't. They had their endings. Let them have their endings. Let this doctor have his ending. It finally wasn't a sad one. Let him have it. And I have a certain amount of faith that that will be allowed to stand. 
And if it turns out later that they do bring him back, I'll probably be annoyed. But for right now, not, not really feeling comfortable and assuming that that will definitely happen, this just feels good. This just feels wonderful. And this kind of having your cake and eating it too is really hard to pull off because Davies himself has failed at it before. Series three, the whole thing with Martha and the uh, the two-parter that ended that, where like Hawk Lafayne come down, and that was also an attempt to like disrupt the doctor's faith in humanity, but it didn't stick. He went right back to praising humanity all over the place right after that, so that felt like it didn't stick. That tried to have its cake and eat it too by having a, this massive decimation of the human population, humans living for a year under complete uh, domination by the Toclophane and the master. And then at the end of it, everything rolls back and just a handful of people remember it all. That was a kind of having your cake and eating it too that is much more common that is usually what you get because it wanted to have the much higher stakes, but then not have the full consequences. And like, if you're going to roll back most of the consequences, nearly all of the consequences of what it was you did, then why'd you do it? Now, there are ways around that, but I don't think that story did it successfully. Here, this is having your cake and eating it too in the best way. Because it's not about avoiding anything. It's about letting us have something that we couldn't have any other way. To see the doctor at a, at a table in a garden having dinner with a with an adopted family that's beautiful just once let him have it the by generation is a wonky idea but to compare it to one that drove me crazy so's the timeless child the difference is the Timeless Child not only didn't result in a story that couldn't be told otherwise, it arguably didn't result in any stories at all. There was almost nothing built off that idea. There was almost nothing done with that idea. This, it is an idea that I do not ever want to see repeated. I do not want this to become the standard of how regeneration works. I do not care if the tenant doctor can regenerate into somebody else. I don't want that ever to be brought up again. Just leave it alone. I don't want the rolling consequence of this. I want it to be its own nice isolated thing. So I am still like iffy about this ever happening again. But for this time, within this isolation, right now at time of talking, I like this. As much as I think that's a bad idea, you built something beautiful that you couldn't build without the foundation of that idea. Whereas The Timeless Child, there was almost nothing built on top of it. And the stories told after that revelation could have happened almost identically without it. That's the difference. You can do something that I think is a bad idea and turn me around on it, not because I suddenly think it's a better idea. I still think within just looking at the notion, I still think the idea by generation is a bad idea, but dang it, Davies, you built something beautiful with it. You made something that we wouldn't have gotten and we couldn't see otherwise. And I gotta give it to you for that. That's amazing. All right, so Shudi Gatwa himself. This might be my one criticism of the episode. Not that I don't, I don't like how he played it. I like how he played it. It had a lot of energy, great smile, wonderful presence. I do feel I didn't get a full sense of him yet because a lot of what he was doing was playing off of Tennant's Doctor. And I don't think that necessarily takes away from Gatwa's Doctor, but it does kind of distract from my ability to get a full read on him. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Most doctors, I didn't feel like I had a proper read on in their first appearance. Really, the only ones where that has been the case, at least in the since the 2005 re, uh, reboot-ish uh, thing started, was Eccleston and Matt Smith. Within their first appearances, I felt like I got them right off. Tennant took a little while. Capaldi took quite a while, but he's now my favorite. Um, Whitaker, I, some, sometimes she worked. Um, but that one, I, I, it was a while before I started to get uh, an angle on her that worked for me. Like more often than not, I don't fully settle on like feeling like I get a doctor right away, but I feel like for how much screen time he gets, yeah, maybe I should have a better idea than I do, but I don't have that much of an idea because I don't get to see him on his own. 
that concern is pretty heavily mitigated by the fact that I'm going to see him again in a pretty short amount of time because he's got the Christmas special. If we were going to have to wait, like, I don't know, six months for his first proper series, or I guess they're going to call this one a season. <sighs> if I had to wait like six months for that, I'd be a little bit more annoyed, but I'm like, I can wait a little while to see what he's like on his own. And yes, I have seen the very short trailer for the Christmas special. I don't really have opinions on it. There isn't enough to go off of. I'm excited for it. I want to see what he does. But I like the energy. I like the energy that he brought. And that's kind of all I have to go on right now. Also because what makes a doctor workable is not just who they are, but also the stories told with them. And this is far more the 14th Doctor story than the 15th. So I can't really gauge him on that basis yet. I'll be able to at least start trying to do so after the Christmas special. So solid first appearance. I like the energy. I don't have a uh, fully settled opinion yet, but that's also pretty typical for me with most Doctors post-regeneration. It usually takes me a little while. Seriously, though, with Capaldi, it took me until his third season to fully fall in love with him. But I did. So we'll see how long it takes. A couple of quick things that basically amount to setup. We have this whole thing with like the essence of the master contained in his tooth. And then that gets picked up by the end by a hand with nail polish on it. This is, this is very deliberately a callback because RTD already did this with after the master died at the end of series three. And it was the ring. And it was a hand that picked it now. I am sure, I'm certain, a ton of people are already going to be speculating, it's the Ronnie! And, like, at this point, it hasn't been the Ronnie for so long. As much as I don't really care for the Ronnie, I could see RTD going, ah, it finally was! But, like, he did jokingly call that the hand of the Ronnie back after Series 3 came out, when, ultimately, when he did bring back um, the Johnson Master, he did something else with it. So... Don't assume that what I, don't assume anything. It will be the mechanism by which the master comes back. Which master will it be? No idea. My gut instinct will be new incarnation because we don't know which incarnation the toy maker encountered and trapped the essence of. It's possible that it is one we've already seen. It could be Dewan. It heck, the toy maker could have swept in and recovered Missy as she was dying and trapped her. You could theoretically do that. I'm expecting it to be a new incarnation. That's my gut instinct. We'll see down the line when this gets pulled on. And that might not necessarily be done by RTD. Again, I've been watching this stuff long enough. I do remember at the time when Series 3 came out, he said that he didn't necessarily have a plan for the Master to come back, but he still planted that ring so that there would be a way that the Master could come back should somebody decide to do it. Turned out he decided to do it before he finished up. He may not actually be the one to pick up the tooth thing, but it's there for whoever does, whether it's him or whether it's a future showrunner. Again, regardless of who it is, I expect probably a new incarnation. There's also the thing from the toy maker about the one who waits. There's only one player I didn't dare face. The one who waits. Which presumably also ties into what the Meep alluded to about the boss. Cryptic. I hate that. One is kind of led to assume, just because it would be really weird if they were both referring to something else, um, that those are one and the same. And I have no theories. Uh, if you're new around here, I'm real bad at speculation. My brain doesn't work that way. My brain, rather than going like, ooh, here's all the deep lore, and ooh, it could be this and connected to that, and here's here's the, the conspiracy board where it all connects. Like, I can't really do that because there's a part of my brain that just goes, just wait and find out what it is. Why are you wasting your mental energy on this? So I very rarely do speculation unless something clicks, which is pretty rare. Um, so I don't really have any speculation on like, ooh, who could it be? It could be anything. And I'd say it has at least as good a chance of being something completely new as it does being something that we've seen before. If I, if, okay. If it's going to be something that we've seen before, my gut instinct pull would be Omega because he's one of the few old school things of that degree of power or at least close to it that you could bring it back. Some might say like the Black Guardian, except... Black Guardian kind of got clowned on a bit uh, in the classic era enough that, I I mean, 
I guess Modern Era hasn't seen him, so I guess maybe you could. I don't know. I I kind of expected something else completely that might be tied to something we've seen, but I I my guess is it's not actually going to be something we've seen before. But what could it be? I don't know. I'm going to wait around and find out. That I do expect to be something that Davies himself answers. I don't necessarily expect him to be the one to follow up on the tooth. I do expect him to be the one to follow up on the he who waits, which it is funny to me that a lot of people, um, especially who were frustrated uh, with Chris Chibnall's era as showrunner, kind of turned to Loki, uh, especially its first season. It's like, see, this, this is giving me the feelings that Doctor Who isn't right now. Um, and I do like Loki a lot. I never quite connected to it on that level, but I will admit, He Who Waits gives me uh, a little bit of a taste of He Who Remains. I think I think it's just the similar weighty language. I don't think there's meant to be uh, an actual uh, connection drawn there. But look, we'll see. I don't really have a coherent theory. So I think, I think, I think that's everything. Wow, I went on a long time. Uh... I don't know how long this is going to end up. Like I've I've got to, I've now got to sit down and edit this thing. Ha. Um oh, th- uh things that um I will follow up on as I said, I will take a look at the behind the scenes stuff and the interviews with RTD and decide if I have another video in me worth of stuff to talk about that. I kind of suspect not, but we'll see. Um I have seen the uh, reveal of Shudi Gatwa's Sonic Screwdriver. I'm going to do a short on that, probably out, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday. I don't know. Um, But I do have some thoughts on that, just not enough for a full video. So I think, uh, I think that'll about wrap it up. Thanks so much for tuning in. There was obviously a lot to talk about, and I didn't really sum up my overall opinion, uh, which, if you couldn't guess, I like this. It did take me some time to come to the conclusion that I like the by generation And the reason I like it is because of the storytelling it enables to happen. As an event unto itself, I'm not that thrilled about it, and I definitely don't want to ever see it happen again. But I've seen the immediate result of what story we get because it happened, and I like that a lot. So between how much fun I had in the first half and how warm the last third, I guess, or so of the episode made me. Yeah, I like this one a fair bit. So what did you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, I've talked about plenty of things, so whatever your thoughts on what you saw or what you heard me ramble out of my mouth are, drop them down in the comments, let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills and enables me to do this as my living. Uh, If you can't help me out that way, like, share, subscribe. Those are also a big help. There's links to other things I do down in the, in the description, but don't worry too much about it. What I really want you to remember is that you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council, and I am just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Time for me to thank my highest supporting patrons. Robin Moore, Zubin Lafula, Goddess Elida, Oliver V, Tarak, The Thing That Goes Doink in the Anime, Ruth, Goes with the Gazarian, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Geek Filter, Melinda Walters, Toku BL Hubian, Jen, Ozzy Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Renabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, Quite Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, Pal Barabad Jagal, I'm sorry for whatever butchery I did to that, and Mira G. I know I've kind of done like funky stuff saying them the last few times. I had this whole idea where I was going to like sing them to the tune of Carol of the Bells, but then I realized it's going to like clash with my outro music, and I didn't really want to rework that or just cut the outro music out altogether. That felt weird, so I just, I just didn't, I just didn't, I just didn't do a thing this time. But now I've told you that I didn't do a thing. So I've made a thing about there being no thing. Okay. Thanks for sticking around. Bye.